Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, Year 6, and welcome back to the next instalment of Storytime with Mr. Ford, where we are continuing to read Gargantis by Thomas Taylor, and we are now on Chapter 17, called Old Squint's Engine. <clears throat> Blaze is the first to reach the deck of his boat, and he immediately sets about untying it from the harbour wall. Violet stops halfway down the ladder and looks up at me. Herbie, come on! But I don't come on. How can I when coming on means doing a thing I said I'd never do again? I think back to when I first told Violet the story of how I washed up at Erie on Sea in a crate of lemons. I remember how impressed I was that she didn't laugh at the lemons part. In fact, she didn't laugh at any of it. Not the bit where Mrs Fossil, who else, found me half drowned on the beach. Or where Dr Tulassi got the seawater out of my lungs. Yikes, I'll never forget that. She didn't even smirk at the part where Lady Kraken took me in and gave me a job in and a uniform and my unlikely name. Which is why it's so annoying when I look down at Violet now, beckoning me onto the boat and see the glint of amusement in her eyes. <clears throat> She's probably one of those people who believes in facing up to your fears, isn't she? Yes, of course she is. Herbert Lemon! That's Bodacia Bates calling that, roaring into the wind from the head of the gang approaching the fisherman. We have things to say to you, boy! And so I'm faced with a choice. Get on the boat, despite the mermonkey's warning, and <clears throat> run the risk of a watery end in the old, cold, dark bottom of the sea. Or don't get on the boat, and face certainty of being nabbed by a bunch of angry fishermen with ropes and knives. I hurry down the ladder. Well, at least this should only be a short trip. The jaunty spark is already moving away from the quite quayside as Blaze shoves an urgent oar against the wall, so I'm forced to jump. Ah! I cry, hitting into the rolling deck and waving my arms to keep balance. Wait for me! Stop complaining and get that rope off the turbine. Blaze barks in return, his shy awkwardness gone as he gives the order. He grabs a tatty skipper's cap from the top hand grip of the wheel and jams it onto his head. We can't engage the engine while the pylon's up, and I can't lower it when the turbine's tangled. I look up at the wind turbine above us. Viewed from the deck, it suddenly seems ridiculously high. I step towards it, but the boat chooses that moment to lean sharply. I let out a groan and clutch a brass hand grip on the wheelhouse. There's a sudden twinge in my scalp as I feel a strange little creature under my cap respond to my alarm. The deck tips even further and everything loose slides across it. We need to get that pylon down, cries Blaze, leaning out over the water using his weight to correct the boat's balance. <clears throat> We're away from the harbour wall now and turning out of control. The turbine makes us top heavy. Herbie! Violet cries, leaning out beside Blaze to help him. There's nothing I can do. My legs are rooted in the spot with fear. The wind shifts and suddenly the boat is swinging back the other way. Violet wastes no time. She jumps forward and shimmies up the pylon like a cat, reaching the top just as it teeters momentarily upright. She scrabbles at the rope, pulling it away in a frantic loops. The coil falls to the deck as the deck starts to tip the other way. Blaze darts over to my side of the boat and swings out over the water again, holding on just by his finger and boot, and boot tips in desperate attempt to counter the weight of the turbine now that a girl's on top of it. Violet slides down the pylon, her boots hitting the deck with a bang. Blaze immediately jumps up to the, into the well house and starts jabbing at switches. With a clack, the wooden blades of the turbine fold down, no longer presenting a windmill to the wind. Then, with a steady clanking sound, the pylon begins to lower towards the deck of the boat. On the harbour wall above, beyond the cry of the seagulls and the harsh gusting of the wind, comes a roar of fury from Bodacia. Blaze Westerly! Bring that lost and founder back here! He has something that belongs to us! This prompts a grumble of angry agreement from the fishermen gathered on the harbour wall. He's aboard the spark now! Blaze calls back, the skipper's cap firmly on his head, and has the protection of the Westerlies. With the pylon lowered, there is less seesaw pressure on the, on the boat, but I'm still clutching the hand grip. Herbie, it's okay, says Violet. Is it? I want to shout. But I can't do anything right now but to cling on. Think of the town, comes the voice of Bodacia Bates again, carrying across the growing distance between us and dry land. Eerie is in danger. No matter how crazy your uncle was, you Westerlies are an old fishing family. You know the law and our ancient rights. That fish-shaped bottle is a dismal business and the property of all us fish folk. You must bring it to us. It's my uncle's business, Blaze calls back, and I will not let you have it. And then, turning to us, he adds, Brace yourselves, I'm going to engage the engine. Do you think they'll try to follow? asks Vi, planting her feet firmly on the deck and grabbing the rail. They think they won't need to, I cry. Look! 
Back on the harbour wall, one fisherman has stepped apart from the others. He starts to twirl a rope, tied into a lasso. There are dozens of things on Blaze's modified boat that he could catch on, not least not least of which the great curving tusk on the prow, and we're still drifting without any power. Blaze grabs a key on the control panel. He turns it. There's a wheezing whining sound as several dials on the control panel light up. A large dial in the centre with the word CHARGE on it flickers with a quivering blue light, its needle trembling at the zero mark. The fisherman throws his lasso with the precision of a man who has done such things all his life. The loop sails through the air towards us as the dial finally lights up a solid blue. The needle slams over from zero to max and the jaunty sparks engine roars into life. Blaze pushes hard on the drive lever. <clears throat> we are flung back with a sudden acceleration. Violent and I cling to the rail and Blaze to his wheel as the motor thrusts us forward at incredible speed, showering us with spray. The rope lasso misses the back of the boat by a finger's width and falls behind us into the churning water. Violet gives a whoop of triumph as we race away. Yes! cries Blaze, his skipper's cap blowing off his head. I got a working again! Oh, see, Uncle, I see! I told you! I told you I was ready! I fixed the engine! But then, just as quickly as it started, the tremendous acceleration stops and the roar of the motor dies away. The blue lights on the control panel flicker out as the need of the dial drops back to near zero. The water that was spraying up behind the jaunty spark as she slides through the sea is soon replaced by some very modest ripples. No! cries Blaze, putting back the drive lever and thrusting it forward again, repeatedly, but uselessly. No, not again! What happened? says Vi. Here, take the wheel. It's me he's talking to. My hands fly out automatically, and now I'm holding the wheel of an actual real-life boat, exactly as if the mechanical monkey with the mermaid's tail had never dispensed me a copy of The Cold, Dark Bottom of the Sea by Sebastian Eels. Blaze slams up a hatch in the wheelhouse floor and jumps down into the dark beyond. An oily and electrical tang wafts out from the hatchway. We're still moving, aren't we? says Vi, joining me at the wheel. Somehow I manage to nod. We are moving, just very, very slowly. The boat bobs into the, in the rolling sea, seeming smaller and more fragile the further we get from shore. So much for the fastest boat in Erie Bay, Violet says and sighs. But at least we put some distance between us and them. I look back at the quayside. The fisherman is still there, watching in silent menace as we make our low speed escape to, the no to nowhere. In the other direction, across a horizon black with storm, a bolt of lightning tears across the sky. We're on the rolling sea, in a boat with almost no power, heading towards the great storm, the greatest storm anyone in Erie has ever known. And I suddenly realise that the nearest land is straight down, down on the cold, dark seabed below. And that is the end of that chapter. And I'll see you next time for the next chapter, which is called The Seafarer's Apprentice.